hand you back over to Pete at this point to introduce, introduce our guest of honor. <laughs> so our, we're pleased to have our, our guest speaker tonight is Gary Curtis. Uh, Gary is a geologist and he has had a long time interest among other, many other things, in meteorites. He says he's been collecting meteorites since 1971, okay? And uh, Gary recently joined or rejoined, whichever it is, this, this club. So he is a, a club member now. Uh, Gary studied geology at Colorado, it was called Colorado West. Western Colorado. Western Colorado College, now a university in Gunnison. He um, worked for some time at the Institute of Meteoritics at the University of Arizona in Tucson, which is one of the centers in the country that particularly studies meteorites. He worked for a time for the U.S. Geological Survey. He worked on mine mine land reclamation and other environmental things. He worked on <clears throat> um, um, mineral exploration and, and permitting of mines and other things. So a, ver a variety of things in, ge in geology and it sounds like meteorites are his special passion and love. And he is going to be talking about Colorado meteorites specifically but I suspect meteorites in general, too. So, yes. Gary, thank you for, for coming. Thank you very much. I'll get out of the way. Well, I'm honored to be invited. And um, like the introduction said, I, I, I went to, I was down at Arizona State University for in the mid-70s. And back then, we were still using slide rules. So um, things have changed an awful lot since then. <clears throat> also. I'm having trouble with my voice tonight, so hopefully you can hear me in the back, and if you can't, just yell out and tell me to speak up. Um, so I brought a bunch of meteorites, and um, I'll talk about meteorites in general and about Colorado meteorites, but the fun to me is passing them around and, and hefting them and feeling them, and also um, maybe getting some of your stories. So I have got a PowerPoint, too, and so it's almost too much. Numbers. Let me see if I can, and uh, when they were discovered. I do have a map of Colorado meteorites here. And um, this is kind of tough to see right now, but you can come up and take a look at it later. This is an up-to-date map of the locations of meteorites that have been found in Colorado. There are 90 approved meteorites right now. So most all of them were, were discovered, were found by farmers or people with metal detectors and people out hunting arrowheads, that sort of thing. And six were, were actually observed to fall. So this is a map of Colorado meteorites, and then there's a list on the wall here of those meteorites. So it tells you what their name is. A meteorite, when it's found, when it, once it is approved, it's named after the, the, the nearest geographical location, whether it's a city or a mountain or something like that. So. Usually they're named after cities or town. Well, um, I'll start out with a few slides and we'll talk about meteorites in general. And this is about Colorado meteorites. And I am in a group called the Comets, the Colorado Meteorite Society, and there's about three of us, at least three others of us here that are in that, that group here. Ann Black was mentioned earlier, she's, she's here, and she's also a meteorite dealer. So she's got a website called Impactica, and if you, if you go into Impactica, you can actually buy meteorites from Ann. Um, so it's, a, it's the Colorado Meteorite Society. Um, and their website is peaktopeak.com if you want to go on it. There's all kinds of great information. Uh, they've got a Google Earth map of all Colorado meteorite locations that are approved. And all kinds of statistics, alphabetical, 
and listings by the type of meteorite, and, and we'll go into that, and uh, a link to the Handbook of Colorado Meteorites. And um, there is something called the Meteoritical Society, and it's an international society for um, meteoritics and planetary science. And what it does is it, it approves, it takes in all, all proposed meteorites and approves their, their name after they've been classified by an institution. So if uh, you go out and you think you have a meteorite, if you take it to an institution that is um, an approved institution, one that does meteorite research, it'll classify it for you if you give them a small piece of it. So um, Arizona State was one, and there's quite a few now all around in the United States and around the world. And uh, UCLA is another one, for instance, New Mexico, Arizona. So. Um, so the Meteoritical Society is an international society. You can go on their website and just if you just go Google the Meteoritical Bulletin, that'll be a database of all meteorites found uh, in, in the world and by uh, country, by state or region, uh, by types and that sort of thing. And I've got a couple notes here. Right now there's somewhere between 50 and 60,000 meteorites worldwide that have been approved, which means they've been recognized and classified as a me being a meteorite. And sometimes one, a meteorite will be, it, it'll be named after one location. There might be thousands that were found. Um, like, for instance, a shower down in Holbrook dropped thousands of small meteorites, but that's counted as one meteorite on this website. And uh, Almost 100%, 99.8% are from asteroids. And back when I was going to school in the 70s, we weren't sure if, even if they were from asteroids or for, from other locations too. But now they know that 99.8% are from asteroids and the rest from Moon or Mars. And there have been a couple that have proposed maybe from Venus or, or Mercury. Um, and then there are about 190 impact craters worldwide in, 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 uh, that have been recognized. There's about 100 here in the United States. So in, in the United States, there are about 1,900 approved meteorites. Some of these are just small individuals that were found in summer, are showers with thousands of individuals. Um, so if you look at the uh, states with the most meteorite finds, Colorado's number seven, I think it is. Texas had, has the most, 313, and uh, and I've got them in, in decreasing order down to Colorado, so you see just a little bit more than uh, Colorado's Nevada, so that's the first one that's got more than 100, and Wyoming right next to it has only got 14, Ohio, and then to give you some examples of back east, Ohio's got 14, I wish I had a Michigan one in here. Um, Connecticut has five, it's got one of the most famous meteorites that was found, and Hawaii's got two as an example. And um, we could go into why or why not. Um, so the, st the statistics on Colorado meteorites are basically there are mostly, well, there's three types of meteorites, stones, irons, and stony irons, and we'll talk about the difference between them. But the irons, as you can imagine, are the ones that, are, that you generally see on display in, in uh, museums. Big, heavy irons. Stones are, uh, look kind of like an igneous rock. And um, most meteorites that have been found in Colorado have been stones. So most of them were found, not seen to fall. And there have only been two stony irons. I don't have any samples or pictures of those. And they're a combination of iron and stony and I've got a, a slice here that we can take a look at. Um, there are five, I was wrong, not, not six, five witness falls that have been seen. And probably the classic one fell in July 6, 1924 in Johnstown. And um, uh, in 67, one small one went, uh, penetrated a roof of a, um, I think a warehouse in downtown Denver. Canyon City was a famous one in 1973. It penetrated uh, the roof of a house, just like the one in New Jersey, I think, that was in the news recently. 
And Albert, I got a small piece of what's left of Albert. That would that was seen to fall in '98, captured on on video cameras, and Bertha also, and that fell in 2004. Um, the largest found in Colorado is the Guffey, and it was found by prospectors down in Guffey, Guffey in 1907. And Guffey's kind of south and west of Cripple Creek a little ways, and there's a, there's a, a prospect field with lots of prospect pits and small mines in this area. And this thing was found by these prospectors there. So this, um, the pictures here show the top and the side view, and you can see the side view, it looks like it's split and it was maybe oriented and came in kind of flat. So there's got to be another part, piece of it out there somewhere. It's just a matter of being lucky enough to find it. And, and actually, um, uh, we, can, we can, let's see if I can go back. One more. And irons are uh, generally, they're pretty simple. Uh, they're generally 92% iron and 7% nickel. Some of them have got a little more iron and some less. And, uh, but that's kind of the average. And um, uh, the Guffey, I can't remember the exact composition, but I've got a few irons here that fall in that range. So that's what the main uh, type of iron, one of the three types there are irons. And the largest one is 60 tons. It was found in Namibia. And it was on a farmer's ranch, and I forget how he found it, but he kind of dug around it. And it's so big that it's never been moved, so they just kind of put some, kind of, uh, put some seating areas around it and dug it out, and people just can go out and view it. So that's a famous one called Hoba. And um, stones are the most common type of meteorite that are found. They're very easily confused, and it's... it's uh, even when I started um, uh, collecting meteorites, it was it was difficult for me to identify it at first until um, I was told how to do it, and it became pretty simple. Um, they're most they're also pretty simple chemically. Um, they're mostly iron, magnesium, silicates, and they've got little flecks of nickel iron in. And um, they uh, the iron, magnesium, silicates are either olivine or pyroxene. And these are orthopyroxenes, and so they'd be uh, encetite and bronzite, which are less common on, on the earth. And um, you get a little bit of feldspar and then nickel iron. You can have maybe 5 to 10 to 15 or 20 percent nickel iron. And um, this is the Little Spring Creek, and we've got a cast and a slice of it here. It was found in 1937 by this, this fellow holding it here when he was a young cowboy out riding on the range. He came across it and held on to it until, what was it, Ann, 19, or 2010 or? 2007. Very, fairly recently. It, was, it says it on, maybe on that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on here. Yeah. This guy held on to it and he got in touch with uh, uh, one of the comets. And they went out and looked at it and identified it. So it was about 3,000 grams and it's 454 grams in a pound, so about six pounds. And um, uh, Jack Williams is the name of the guy, so it's been it was classified and um, recognized as it's one of the most recent um, meteorites in Colorado. And, and that's a cast of the meteorite; that isn't the real meteorite. Yeah, so. this right here is a cast, and you can come up and take a look at it. And it's it's weighted to be to. to um, to be about the same weight as the, the one that was found. So you can kind of get an idea of the density. Um, we got some more Colorado stones here. Um, <coughs> and stones have got, um, <coughs> stones have got little tiny spherical things about a millimeter size or like millimeter size marbles are called chondrules. And most stony meteorites are called chondrites because of the chondrules. And this is um, a picture of a slice, a polished slice with chondrules in it. And on the right, it's a weather surface showing the, the roundness of the chondril. And if you find a, a stone that, that's got these, this, this in it, then 
chances are that's one way of telling you whether it's a, a stony meteorite or not. And um, so that's one character that's one major major characteristic. We'll talk about a few other the others and I'll I'll pass around some here shortly. And then the third type is stony irons, and they're about half and half stony material and iron material. And these are two huge ones. This guy is holding a, a huge slice that was cut on a big wire saw. And that's, those are olivine crystals, uh, light shining through the olivine crystals. And then the, the gray is, is the iron, the nickel iron. The same composition as uh, an iron meteorite, about 92% iron, 7% nickel. Um, here is somebody on the right holding a, media, a stony iron that was found in the field, and it shows how it's kind of rusty on the outside. And until it's cut and polished, you don't know what you have. But once again, here is a, a nickel iron and the olivine on the left hand side of a sliced piece. Um, and then we'll talk, uh, let's go into a couple of uh, interesting finds in Colorado. Then we'll, then we'll pass some around and look at them. Um, 1924, July 6, 1924, fireball came across, from the east across over Johnstown and um, blew up over Johnstown and shot off pieces, uh, continued all the way west to Mead, which is across um, I-70 or I-25. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, this is a, a piece that was, that, that was found. This may be a, a large piece. It embedded itself in the steps of the Elwell Cemetery Church, and there was a uh, uh, there was a funeral going on at the time, and this thing blew up, and some of the people thought it was a sign from from heaven. Uh, <laughs> there so, was a great article in the Johnstown Breeze from cool. from back then about this, and um, another picture of, of the pieces there. Um, it was with July 6th, or it was a holiday. People were out playing baseball, and, and people playing baseball saw it blow, blow up. And, and um, I actually spent some time out there looking for it, and um, never found any. And, and um, the reason is, is that um, I, I spent a long time in the 80s going out around talking to people, talking to farmers, walking fields. Finally, one guy told me, well, uh, have you found any? And I said, no. And he said, well, you know, this has been land level, right? All this whole area has been land level. And I said, well, what is land leveling? And he said, what? He said, it used to be really hilly out here. There used to be a lot of hills and ravines and stuff. And so, so um, one government agency, I don't, I don't know if it was Bureau of Rec or somebody came in, maybe the Soil Conservation Service, and they just leveled the whole area. They took off the hills and filled in the low spots. Mm -hmm. So uh, I spent weeks and weeks. <laughs> That's how it goes. Then another interesting one fell in October of 1973 in Kansas City. This penetrated the roof of a house. People were away out to dinner when it happened, but they left their cat locked in the garage. And this meteorite pierced the, the, uh, the roof over the garage, and it went in and broke and, and, and scattered pieces around inside the garage. So when the people came home, they opened the garage and the cat just took off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so there, here, here's a, here, two, two uh, scientists from uh, the Denver Museum of Natural History back then uh, looking at the hole the uh, in the there's roof. Science right and there in the garage looking up at the hole. Where then more recently, in 98, uh, a meteorite came from the west. It came over Colorado Springs, was caught on cameras. And it blew up and landed, and it shot pieces down around Elbert, just north of the town of Elbert. And um, it was 681 grams, so not quite uh, two pounds. And this is the picture of it. And um, uh, another meteorite collector and I bought it from the, uh, the, the, it was a boy who found it. And we sliced up parts of it to sell so we could pay him. And then I've got what's left of it here. And so there was a lot of people looking. So here's, I got a couple videos of uh, fireballs. Everybody's probably seen them. This one sometimes wants to work and sometimes doesn't. Let's see if it does. Um, 
try it again. I don't think it's going to work, so we'll go to the next one. Okay, this one, this one fell in 1992, and it's called the Peekskill, so it landed near Peekskill, New York. Uh, it was October 9th, and um, we'll, we'll watch the video. Let's watch the video first. There was a, I think it was a Friday night or Saturday night, there were football games going on, so that's a lot, one of the lights at a football field, and they, and here's a, here's a couple pieces. This may be the same piece it was of people taking uh, videos of the football game, and they looked up and took pictures of the meteorites. So, usually, what happens is a small asteroid or a large body. Um, wow! Uh, and it hit. It, it, it hit this, this. This there was a family in watching TV, and they heard a big boom. They went out in this poor girl's car uh, was, was hit by the meteorite, and this the, the meteorite is actually resting. I see it right here, right there. There's the meteorite. Oops, that's not showing up there. But it's right. The meteorite is actually sitting on the bumper, right in there. So she sold it, and she she made enough to buy two or three brand new cars. <laughs> And uh, let's go to the next one. Oh, oh uh, yeah, let's go to the next one. Here's here's a. Okay, this is a map of where that fireball was seen. So it was seen, I think, in about six different states, including West Virginia, Ohio, or maybe just West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, and uh, I think I might be missing one more in there. And so it'll be seen across a broad area. Sometimes people will see a fireball, if you're lucky. I've never seen a big one. And think it just landed. It just was over the hill there, but it could be hundreds of miles away by the time it landed. Okay, this, many of you also probably heard about the, the Russian fireball that blew up in 2013. So a lot of the Russians have dash cameras. So here's, here's one. Um, this, this is what it was like, it was, I forget it was, if it was, I think it was early morning, if I'm not mistaken. So this guy has a dash cam and he stops at a red light. And you'll see the fireball just appear from the left. And it's, it's called Chelyabinsk, after the town of Chelyabinsk. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it was, so it was, it was just as bright as the sun, you know, when it went across. That's cool. Okay, the next one. Um, this is the same thing. Okay, this is the one that I don't have a sound for. I have the sound turned up on here, so you might hear a little pop and a little boom. And but if you you can go online on YouTube and watch this, just type in Chelyabinsk meteorite. And it, there's, if this is about two minutes, and what you'll see is, um, you'll see the trail, the, the, the fireball, the, the asteroid has already gone by, and it's left a trail of debris, because it, it's just melting and, and losing debris all the way across the sky. And, and after a minute or two is when finally the sound, the sound catches up to it. So let's see if you can, you can hear it. We'll see. So it's already gone across, somebody grabbed their camera, they're standing in their apartment, and they're taking pictures of the, of the dust trail. Still no sound. If you can hear some little pops. That's, those are tiny little sound catching up. That's it. But if, if you've got good speakers, it almost knocks you off your, off your chair. So car alarms go off, dogs start running around, people pull over and get out and they're looking up, they're wondering what happened. It's, uh, it, it, it's got to be very startling. I, I love to experience it sometime. <laughs> or have one penetrate my roof. I mean, <laughs> go for that too.
like three more in the world. Oh, yeah, there's a <laughs> dog. Oh, <laughs> Does it get me out? You'll see people get out, they'll, they'll start talking. And then luckily this person keeps on taking pictures. And you can hear sirens off, I mean car alarms off in the distance. And I think this is about done. And here, here they are getting their cameras out and talking and saying what happened. But uh, this thing loses most of its mass is in, the, in that trail, in the dust trail there. So are there smaller ones that come down from it? Yes. Yes, and we'll see that. I, I've got a few small ones here, oh, okay. and um, I got them online, and also at the September Gem and Mineral Show, some Russians had some of this stuff right after it, and were selling it, so I got some. Um, okay, now, that's over with, so let's go to the next one. Okay, this one is a compilation of the damage that was done. Um, Something like 12,000 12, people were injured. Here's a guy taking the picture and all of a sudden he's... <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's the, the air blast knocking out windows. And oh, Sets off more car alarms. Man, oh, imagine minding your own business and then some random thing stuff. like this happens. She <laughs> runs. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> <laughs> I would too, I think. Oh, Is that a wall? How many people died? No. No one. No one. No one died? Just Nobody was hurt by the meteorite. They were hurt by the shockwave. Right. There's one coming up. And so the classroom set in. One of the guys looks like a young Leonard Nimoy. So see if you think, if you agree with me. So a lot of people got injured by by broken glass. That was most of the injuries. So you you see the light go by, and then later on. The air, the air blast hits. Hmm. It's because it's going slower. Finally. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Okay, there's Le Leonard, Leonard Nimoy in the background there. <laughs> <laughs> So that one is on YouTube. It's, it's fun to go turn your speakers up and listen to it. So se over 7,200 buildings were damaged and 1,500 injuries, mostly from flying glass. Um, and then the question was asked, were little ones and big ones found? And yes, if I can get the next one to come up. People went out. It was it was February, so there was snow on the ground and ice on the on the uh, on a nearby lake called the Jabarco Lake. People went out and they looked for holes in the snow, and then they dug down. And they found little meteorites. So here's here's a couple here, and I sent off for some and found and bought some from some of my Russian friends that are meteorite dealers. I brought them over. So this is what it was like where they found them. And then a few months later. The main mass was found, it weighed about a ton, and it was found, it formed a circular hole in Tobarco Lake. And um, 
Here it is on the right. It was just pulled out. They, uh, divers located it, they put a net around it, and they pulled it up. And I don't know if I got a, a picture in here, but it's on display. Uh, it's on display in, in uh, I think, the, the museum in Moscow. So let's look at some of these and talk about how to identify them. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about how, where, if you wanted to go look, how you might look and where. And um, so let's see what I got here. Let's see if I can do this without tripping over some of these wires. On this table, is a lot of this is, um, these are meteorites from Colorado. Um, one of the, well, starting with iron meteorites, this one is not. This is uh, a magnet. It's, it's off of a hard drive, so it's a strong magnet. And it'll stick to any iron meteorite. Um, and uh, this is this was found in Argentina actually, and there are, I mean there are some pe some pieces of this is called Campo de Cello, which means field of the sky, something like that, loosely translated I think, isn't that right, Ann and Debbie? Mm -hmm. And this this I don't know this might be 25 pounds or something like that. It's a complete individual, um, but some of them are weigh a few tons, and um, this is from Canyon Diablo, from Meteor Crater, Arizona, and I'll pass it around, and it's, oh, it's, uh, you can look at it, I got the weight on here, and I can't, I don't have my glasses, it's uh, a couple pounds or three pounds, so, and this, it's been, <coughs> excuse me, it's been wire brushed, so when they're, when they're found in the field, this was found in a smaller crater near Odessa, Texas, and once again, this is almost two pounds, 787 grams. <coughs> this is what what it looks like when it's just found. Yeah. And just, you can just pass them around. Yeah, you just pass them around, everybody. So that's iron meteorites, 92% 92% iron, 7% nickel. <coughs> pretty heavy, pretty dense. <coughs> so I got a drainage. Problem. Uh, sometimes, some of my, I, I swallow saliva, it goes down in my lungs, so it <coughs> causes me to cough. Um, there was a, also in Russia, in 1947, there was a huge meteorite that, that uh, blasted out of the eastern part um, of Russia called the Sokotyalene Mountains, and maybe the Sokotyalene Oblast, I can't remember the, the state, and um, some large and small iron meteorites were found there. The interesting thing about it is, is that there was a shower. It came down maybe as one large mass. Maybe it was fractured and it blew up about five miles above the ground. And it shot down a bunch of smaller individuals. Some of them had time. Uh, they were burning. And as they burned, um, the, the blast of hot air um, uh, it, it forms a fusion crust that actually rounds off corners and sweeps away the outer skin of the meteorite while the inside stays cold. And, um, but it actually it falls as a complete little individu individual with little what they call regma lips, which are tiny little holes. If this was a bigger uh, piece, they, they'd call it a thumbprint. And this is such from uh, a complete individual that landed and was found by enterprising Russians that went out and uh, <coughs> excuse me, about 2,000 dug up a bunch of them. They used metal detectors. I don't know how they did it. So this is out in the middle of nowhere. And, but the other thing that happened was some of the large individuals were large enough that they hit and they formed an impact crater and they fractured. And they looked, they, they blew apart and it looks like shrapnel. Here's a piece of shrapnel. Now this has been wire brushed and oiled a little bit. It uh, would have been a little bit browner when it was found, but I'll pass that around too. That's, that's also from part of the Sokotyalene um, meteorite shower, and, um, but that is what they call a, a shrapnel piece. So when this came out, those sold for less. You bought, we bought them from all of these from the Russians. And these sold for a lot less than the complete individuals. Now, these also go for more. The price is going up on all these things. Um, 
<coughs> okay, I've got some, and I won't pass these around, but you can come up at any time afterwards and look. We've got a few irons from Colorado, not many. These two are from what is called the Bear Creek Iron, and if you saw the meteorite display either last, what was it, February or September um, at the show, um, this is, this is a, a slice of the Bear Creek Iron. It was found in, I think, 1880 or something. I can't remember the exact date. And it was found by um, Morrison and another guy. Um, and if I get my glasses, I could actually read the date on there. <laughs> Can I help? 1866. Is that, is that what it says? One of them. Right. 1966. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, well, no, they, uh, that's not right. That's a mistake. It should be. It's 18. Uh, that, the other piece has the correct date. That was the label that yeah, was it's when we bought it. That's yeah, it was. It's one of the first that was found. Yeah, 1866. And um, this was one of the first ones that was found uh, by Morrison and this other guy. And uh, they found it up um, west of Morrison, up there, Creek, a ways. So. Few other people and I have talked about trying to find it, but it was very kind of the location was is not exact, so who knows exactly where it is. Oh, I'll pass this around. This is also well, I'll save this. This is another piece of Sacodiolene. It's a it's an example of an oriented meteorite. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about it right now. <laughs> Might as well. This is um, I'm going to keep it in the bag, but I'll take it out to show you. <clears throat> and the reason I have some of these bagged is that um, sometimes the oil and the sweat from our from our hands, if, if, it, if it gets too much, it helps them rust a little bit. So this is oriented, and it's oriented with the big the big end down. And if you look at it close, you'll see um, what looks like radiating regolips or radiating flow lines away from this this edge down, and the the bottom edge is perfectly smooth, but um, there's a little kind of a rollover lip where just the outer skin was melting and it was being swept up towards the tail of this thing as it came down. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll keep that up here for now. And um, so those are iron meteorites, nickel and iron mostly, a little bit of uh, carbon, sulfur, um, and then uh, some of the... Um, uh, minor elements, very minor, um, like iridium and uh, other uh, metals like that. Iridium's a big one because that's, there's enough, quite a bit of iridium in meteorites, especially iron meteorites, that uh, has been found in clay layers. And those clay layers are, um, they find the, the, the boundary between the, um, basically defining the end of the age of dinosaurs and the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Uh, now they call it KP, the Paleogene boundary. Um, then you have the stony meteorites, and these are the ones that really stumped me. Uh, the first time I found about stony meteorites was in 1971. And I was a student up at Gunnison, and I walked into a rock store, and there was a bin and it said meteorites. And I thought, wow! And so I, I picked up one, and it kind of looked like this right here. And but it was it was more had it looked it looked kind of like a magnetite, which is is what it was. But I wasn't sure. And I was a geology student, so, and I bought a junior or senior, and I thought, well, I should know what this is. But I wasn't sure, so I bought a small one. And at the time, I was making a dollar an hour washing dishes at the Oasis Bar and Cafe, so it was only about two or three um, hours a night. So I didn't have a lot of money to spend, so I bought one. I took it to uh, the campus. Nobody there knew for sure if it was a meteorite. So I finally found the American Meteorite Laboratory and Glenn Huss, who was uh, the son-in-law of the most famous meteorite collector called Harvey Neininger, that at the time lived here in Denver, and they helped me identify it. and. And said, no, it's just a piece of uh, probably magnetite. And, uh, but that got me looking for meteorites. And he taught me about uh, uh, stone meteorites. So stone meteorites, I'll pass this one around. This weighs about a pound, maybe. And this is from the Western Sahara. 
A lot of meteorites were found out right there, uh, right now. Um, and um, it's, it's a little denser than, a, than a, say, a piece of granite or, or an igneous rock. Um, and it also should be magnetic. Where's my magnet? Here it is. Try this on it. Keep that away from your phone, though. So the, the magnet does stick to it a little bit, and I'll pass the magnet around. It's, some of stony meteorites have got more iron and nickel in them. There's little flecks of iron and nickel in them. And this one right here, actually, Little Spring Creek is a slice from a stony. And if I just hold it up, hold it on the edges there, and can you see when I move it back and forth, can you see all the, the metal that's uh, reflecting in there? So there's quite a bit of iron and nickel in there, and that's what attracts the magnet. Um, if you find something like this one here, and you think it's a meteorite, you're not sure, just put it on a polishing wheel, or you can use a file, a real fine file, and file it, and see if there's only any flecks of nickel and iron in there, or if it's attracted to a magnet. And sometimes magnetite will be attracted to a magnet, but if you file it, it won't look like um, like that slice that I just showed you on the inside. Um, here's another one I'll pass around. This is also from the Sahara. So many, this hasn't been classified, which means this was picked up by uh, some a Bedouin or somebody out. Uh, some a lot of the a lot of these former goat herders and Bedouins and out have trained their eye and they go out and look for meteorites and they're they're great at finding them. And then they, they take them up to a trading center, like Air Food, and there's a bunch of other little towns. They're a trading center, and then guys like Ann or Debbie or, or myself, and I have never gone over there, will go. And they'll buy them from these guys, and then they'll come to the States and they'll sell them. And um, so this, this, this one I got at either Tucson or the, spring, or the uh, September show here in Denver. It's a stone. It's got a little bit of fusion crust. So when these things, when they're a fireball shooting across the sky, the outer skin, just about one millimeter thick or less, is burning at any one time. But it's constantly being swept away as it shoots through the air. And so um, uh, the inside still stays, st still stays cold. And people have gone out and seen a meteorite land on a frozen lake, and it didn't break the ice, or land in a hay field and didn't burn the hay, and actually touched it. Sometimes if it's been a, a few minutes or a couple of minutes since they, uh, before they can get to it, they found frost on it if it's in, in the winter. So this is a stony meteorite, and it's a breccia. Um, and uh, we've, uh, scientists have now discovered that many meteorites, maybe most of them, actually are, uh, are, are brecciated from impacts that occurred millions or billions of years ago on tiny little, on the asteroids and the early planetesimals that, that formed the solar system. This is a breccia. It's got the iron and nickel. It's got little veins and little uh, blebs of nickel and iron in it. So I'll pass that around. I cut it. It's never been classified. I have no idea. It would probably be called an H meteorite, which means a uh, high total iron and um, high amount of free uh, iron and nickel in it. Um, here's another one I'll pass around. This, this is another uh, uh, meteorite found in the Sahara Desert. They call these NWAs, which is short for Northwest Africa. And any time that um, uh, a new meteorite that is brought in by the, or sold by the Moroccans, um, and they will sometimes tell you, well, it's near such and such a mountain range, the Atlas Mountain Range or whatever. They might even have a town. Usually it's just out in the middle of nowhere. So when these, can, these come in and they're classified, one is sent to, say, UCLA, and a researcher there, the main one is Alan Rubin. If he, if he classifies it and says, yeah, it's a meteorite and it's a stone meteorite, and stones are either called H's or L's, which basically stands for high or low iron and nickel, and total iron. Um, then he'll, he'll assign it an N, NWA number. So the very first one that wasn't from uh, a geographic area or a town was NWA1. And now they're up to like, a, N, what is it, an, N, NWA14,000, 16? 15,000. 15. 
So there's a lot of them that have been found. Some small, some huge. This is, this is probably more than a pound. This is what it looks like when they find it. Pass that around. Um, and um, this, I'll pass this around too. This was also found in Morocco. And it's called Zag. Z-A-G. And I think Zag's from about 2000, somewhere around 2000. It was a shower that was found. It was observed. Found, and it was, it's named after the town of Zag. This one's got the weight on it. It's 152 grams. So 452 grams, 454 gram, grams in a pound. So it's, you know, maybe a, a quarter of a pound, maybe a third of a pound here. And it's got fresh black fusion crust. This is what it looks like when it burns on the outside. It's very thin, just tiny. It's not even a millimeter thick. And the inside still say it was basically cold um, like it was in outer space. And um, it's a stone. And it's uh, the matrix and the chondrules are composed of um, basically um, uh, olivine and pyroxene. Probably instatite or and, and or bronzite and, and olivine. So I'll pass that around. And, um, and then the third kind that we talked about are stony irons. So there's only two from Colorado. Um, there's no pictures on the Peak to Peak on the Comets website. And I, um, I don't have any samples and I don't know if anybody did that. So I've got here, this is a stony iron found in Russia. And I think it was about 2000 also. It was Actually, the original one was found in 1967, but a bunch of it was brought out later. Um, put this on this side here. So, this, let me take it out. This is, once again, I've got it in a plastic bag to keep um, moisture and oils from my hand from from um, ruining it. So this is this is stony iron. It's part iron, and and then part of it is uh, the stony iron here. So it's kind of an interesting uh, combination of the two. And you'll see some triangular lines in there. That's called the Whitman Staten pattern. And the Whitman Staten pattern is named after I think it's a Swedish researcher that discovered it. He and one other guy that discovered this pattern at about the same time. They discovered. Um, that if you cut it, polish it, and if you etch it with, um, in this case, it was a nitric wheat solution of nitric acid, uh, that it brings out some lines of high and low nickel content. And it turns out that when uh, this was um, in a, uh, an asteroid body that was um, differentiating into a core and a mantle, um, that this would have represented the core of this body. It was molten and it slowly cooled. And as it cooled, it grew into octahedral crystals. So that's what you see here. And as an I'll, I'll, um, I'll keep this up here. And you can come and take a look at it later. Um, and uh, so those are the three major kinds. Um, this is from Colorado. This is part of what's called Clifford. Clifford was a 25-pound meteorite. It was found by a guy out hunting arrowheads in eastern Colorado, out near Araba, west or east of um, Lyman. And he came across this 25-pound rock he thought was interesting looking. And he, he went to a friend and said, is this a meteorite? And the guy was thinking of iron meteorites. He said, no, it's not a meteorite. So this guy, he, uh, if you've ever been out to G Genoa, or is he, I think it's called Genoa, Colorado, and there's a, a tourist, uh, a tourist trap with a tower there called the Genoa Tower. This guy owned it, so he put it in, in his uh, rock garden and painted it red. <laughs> he sat out there, and then, then I came along in about '98 and told him I was looking for meteorites. And he said, "Oh, wait here!" And he came and he took this whole thing and he just set it down. There's still a little red paint on it. I said, "What do you think of this?" So I thought, yeah, I think this is a meteorite. So I ended up buying it from him after we negotiated for a while. 
And so this is what's left of it. I bought it, cut it, sliced it, traded, and sold a little bit, and, and still have that. So, so if you look at it, um, it, 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 it's hard to tell when you look at this whether it's just a, a brown piece of concrete or, or what. Um, but they'll have, when it's cut and polished or when you file the edge, you'll see a little bit of nickel iron in there. It's heavier. It, it should be magnetic. And uh, when that magnet comes around, you can try that magnet on the outside here of this. Um, oh. Oh. oh, thanks. Yeah, there's a magnet on here. So this is an L, which means low total iron, but it should swing towards it. And see, it does. I don't know if, you, if I'm holding it high enough that you can see that. And that more powerful magnet will stick to it. Thank you. And um, so those are three things there. You can test it. If, if, you, if you can't find somebody to take it to, you can, you can look how to do a, te a quick test for nickel. And if you get a positive test for nickel, then you almost surely have a, a stony meteorite. So those are three things you look for. Also, you might look for what are called regmalips. This has got a few on this end, which are some of those little, they call them thumbprints too, but these are small. But it's like a little kid or somebody took their finger in wet clay and poked it in. And these are um, diagnostic, these are very characteristic of, of meteorites and then part of it is smoothed off, um, which is also characteristic. You barely get that Swiss cheese look. This one is closer to it and because it had some uh, carbon inclusions that burn out. But most meteorites are kind of smoother looking. Here is um, two casts of, of uh, Colorado meteorites. This this is called Little, Little Spring Creek, and it's got some regma lift right here. Now, this is a cast, but it's been weighted so that it's the same weight as uh, the original. This is the slice, and this is, once again, this is the meteorite that was found by that guy that finally sold it when he was older, but he was a young cowboy at the time that he found it. This is a cast of... Uh, one of the Johnstown, this is a great piece of the Johnstown meteorite. I wish this, this was the actual piece here. <laughs> so do I. And if it was, it'd be worth <laughs> yes. not tens, but maybe hundreds of thousands, or hundred thousand dollars, I don't know. There's some pieces of the Johnstown in the uh, School of Mines Museum. Yes, yes, yeah. And of course, the museum, the museum of Nature and Science has some great ones, but they're not on display anymore. They were years ago. Mines has got three cases on the lower floor, and they've been re-renovating uh, the lower floor, so the new display should really be quite spectacular. Yeah, thanks for, for pointing that out, because the Mines Museum is great. I mean, they've got a wonderful, matter of fact, Dan Ray, I don't see him here tonight, but he really did a lot of work out there. I mean, it's a wonderful display. They've got uh, on display, too, the, uh, a bunch of the newspaper clippings from the Johnstown uh, meteorite. Yes, that would be nice to see. They have a lot of Harvey Nininger's collection. Yeah. But they, they've got dozens of his pieces. Yeah, and some, they've got some unique Colorado meteorites that you can't see anywhere else. I think they've got one or two that are almost the entire mass out there, and I can't remember the names of them. But the mines are great, not to mention two Apollo lunar samples. They had a piece of the Arapaho. Yeah, Arapaho. Which was, which was 19 kilograms or something. I'm surprised yeah. you didn't mention it as one of the bigger Colorado. Uh, yes. And that's on here. And you can come up here and see that. Arapaho is out right... Uh, out in Cheyenne County. So, yeah. So it's out here somewhere. Once again, I don't have... Here's, here's Araba. Here's... Um, that Clifford, where Clifford was found. Little Spring Creek should be down. Here's Little Spring Creek. We talked about Canyon City. Um, and Bear, here's Bear Creek. Here's Denver. Um, you can come and take a look. Some of the early ones were found by prospectors. So Bear Creek was one. Um, and one that I showed already is uh, right here. Um, Finding it now, but I'm looking for the. Um, well, I'm not sure why I'm not finding it, but uh, Guffy, here it is. Guffy's right 
here, uh, Russell Gulch, and what's the other one? Rifle. Uh, Russell Gulch was found by prospectors, I think, too, up, up in the Central City area. So that's the 1800. Um, okay. Um, we talked about um, orientation. This is a stone meteorite. Once again, it's a Western Sahara NWA meteorite. It hasn't been classified. But it's smooth on one side and rough on the other. And so this apparently was oriented face down this way. And um, I'll just keep it up here, but you can look at it to see the difference of it. It's kind of like almost like a, a nose cone um, um, from one of the Apollo landers or re entry vehicles. Um, and I'll mention briefly a couple of others here. Another type of stony meteorite is called a carbonaceous chondrite, and there's been a lot of news about carbonaceous, or in the news about carbonaceous chondrites. This one's uh, probably the most plentiful uh, carbonaceous chondrite that's seen to falls, called Allende, after Pueblo Allende in Mexico. And um, it's got little, it, it's, carbonaceous chondrites are called that because there's more carbon in these than other sto stony meteorites. And these are also older. These are some of the most primitive meteorites that, that we have. And there are these little, little white specks that you see on here are uh, called calcium aluminum inclusions. They're high, composed of high refractory minerals. And um, when these in, uh, CAIs, they call them, when they were uh, analyzed by different researchers, they found that they contain um, pre-solar um, diamonds and, and other uh, elements that were formed in, uh, uh, the, break, in, in the explosions and, and uh, supernovas of stars that existed before our solar system. Mm -hmm. So not only do they contain diamonds, but they're even older, maybe up to four, 14, uh, 14 billion years old. So that's Allende. And um, let's see. And I've got a, a sample of a lunar meteorite. Here's a lunar meteorite. This one is from near the, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a the match with the, let's see, the lunar, the Apollo, I'm trying to remember, Apollo 16 site, I think with the Apollo 16 landing site. And this is a uh, Martian meteorite. It's called NWA 4734. This one also has, a, has an NWA number. And this is part of a piece of Mars. And um, we, can, we can talk about how they, uh, how they know, how they decide they're from those, those two areas. So um, are, are there some questions right now? Or should I go on? Or how much time have I got? I think it would probably be a good time to Take some questions and have people come and look at them. Okay. <clears throat> yes? Um, I was wondering if are they discovering any other elements or minerals in these that are not off on the planet? <clears throat> minerals that are not, not Earth terrestrial minerals? There have been a few that have been found. One of them is called Lawrenceite, which is an iron chloride. And that's a bad one because there's iron chloride in iron meteorites. And what happens is when they're exposed to moisture, here on Earth, it combines with the H2O, and it forms hydrochloric acid, HCl. And, and so many irons that you, you get, if they've been especially ex been found in a wet area, start to rust right away. I've got some that are doing that, even some stony irons with that in it. There's a few others, but most of the, most of the minerals, especially the ones that are common to meteorites, are, are common here on Earth. At least the pyroxenes, there are pyroxenes in, in meteorites and here on Earth. The only difference is, is that the, the, um, the pyroxenes and meteorites are ortho, orthorhombic pyroxenes, so ensotite and bronzite as opposed, I'm, I'm sorry, hypersteen and bronzite as opposed to ensotite, which is more common here on Earth. And then the other one is olivine, which is found here on Earth as well as in meteorites. So, um, but there are a number of others and I, might have had a list of those somewhere, but I didn't include in this, and I can't remember any of the others. Yeah? So, um, I'm not really sure why, but apparently the, the algorithms of the internet have decided that I really want to know 
that scientists say you shouldn't wave your magnet near your meteorite <laughs> because it erases the scientific yeah. record of whatever. So what's the deal with that? Well, yeah, I, I just learned about that fairly recently myself because I... I checked. Yes. With scientific people. They tell me if it is a very old, very weathered, yes. like what you're most likely It's already to destroyed find, anyway. It's too it? late anyway. Right. There is nothing left. Right. So, but, never mind. <laughs> yeah. So well, it's good know. only for yeah. very, very recent. Yeah. And see, what they scientists do, they put aside a, two, three very good pieces, nice yeah. crust. Both go aside there, very yeah. well taken care of, wrapped into foil, very carefully. The rest have at it. Right. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, if you no, got a... As long as science is taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's a new meteorite that falls, then you don't want to you don't want to put a meteor uh, a magnet up to it until you know researchers have a piece of it. Yeah. How, how do they tell if it's from Mars? What's the difference yeah. between Earth and Mars? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that's a good question. One is the age, and um, another is isotopes. And one of the one of the things I do is use oxygen isotopes and isotope ratios and compare those to terrestrial rocks and they, they match up more with oxygen isotopes that have been measured by uh, landers on Mars. But the, well, the key one is that, um, well especially with the moon, but with Mars, um, they, uh, they've, they've taken what they suspected was a Martian meteorite, found little vesicles, little holes in them, and found a way to sample the gas, and it's on a one-to-one one one ratio with the gas that's measured on Mars. And so the age and a number of other things, too, isotopes, um, uh, show that it's, it's, they're from Mars. So, um, and I've got a slide about that, but it's probably more than we can go into right now. And the moon, the same thing. They, they've compared the lunar, what we found to be lunar meteorites with uh, lunar rocks that came back, there were a few hundred pounds that came back on what, six or seven Apollo missions. So they compare with those like that one there, Apollo's, with the, it, it uh, matches one to one with the Apollo 16 landing site. So that's in a nutshell kind of how they tell. Yeah? I, I was just saying, you might want to reiterate what's important about chondrules, because you don't find those on Earth rocks. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. Chondrules are made of olivine and pyroxene, but there's nothing like it on the Earth. And today, as far as I know, scientists don't know how they form. They don't know the mechanism that formed them. They know that they formed back in the solar nebula 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago. And they, they, they can tell they were flash melted. Sometimes they're rimmed with metal. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're a complete crystal of olivine or a complete crystal of pyroxene, sometimes there are accumulation of them. Um, but that's the neat thing about stony meteorites is they, they are almost, they've almost all got chondrules in them. Some don't, most all of them do. And there, there's nothing like uh, the treasure rock. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering about buying online a lot of uh, phony stuff coming out of Northwest Africa. And oh, a lot of phony stuff? Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, if you go on, if you go on eBay now, and it'll say, choice meteorite or guarantee. Yeah, and they'll want, yeah, it'll be as big as a tennis ball, maybe, and they'll want a million dollars for it. And this piece of slag, or basalt or who knows what, something like that. Yeah, if, if I were <clears throat> buying um, a meteorite online or whatever, I would buy it from a well-known, reputable yes. dealer in meteorites like Ann Black. Yeah, you need to go to somebody example. like Ann. She's, <laughs> she'd be perfect. Impactica is her, her site. You could, you could call her up and talk to her. Have you seen any of the papers about uh, extinction, mass extinction of woolly mammoths in Siberia? Well, did you, did you, know yeah, you know, I haven't, for woolly mammoth, I haven't I've seen the other, the, ex, the other, you know, I think there's five major extinction events. A bunch of people in Stanford were working on this, and what they found was the tusks were perforated with micrometeorites. Really? Hundreds and hundreds of them. 
Wow. So that it, that's uh, sometime true. about 10,000 yeah. years ago. Mammoth's tusks. There was an uh, enormous yeah. meteor shower that took out a lot of the megafauna. So wow. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. evidence is as, as absolute as the, as the meteorites embedded in tusks. Wow. That one I hadn't heard of. Yeah, I, so it would be neat, it, it, mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't surprise me if they come up, come, thing, come, come some. I don't know if everybody heard it, but the, it, it looks like there is now studies showing that they found meteorite debris in tusks, and uh, maybe iridium, and uh, other things like that. So they're thinking that there was an event 10,000 years ago that uh, was responsible for the extinction of woolly mammoths and others. There's partial extinction. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I know that there's uh, there are studies now that think that there's there's an extinction event, I think, in the Devonian or at the end of the Devonian, <clears throat> at the end of the Devonian that probably or possibly was um, uh, caused by huge impacts. Hmm. And here's something real quick, you can look at it. This is one of the evidences for an impact crater. It's called Shatter Cones. This is from Sierra uh, Madera. Uh, impact crater in Texas, and I probably am up against it because I'm not, I'm not sure of my time. But that's here, and um, when large impacts occur on the, uh, on Earth, uh, a lot of Earth is um, and rock is shot up in the air. It's melted, and it, as it um, cools, it it, it, it uh, gets oriented. Uh, this one is oriented aerodynamically as it came back. And this one was spinning, perhaps. These are called tektites. They're from Indochina. I think they're, I can't remember the exact location of these. And in uh, Egypt, there's something called uh, Libyan Desert, or Libyan Desert. There's uh, uh, Libyan Desert Glass. And they think this is also related to an impact from an asteroid that melted sand and fused the sand, and then this was a result. And I think King Tut has got some of this stuff that's carved in some of the King Tut jewelry. Um, green tektites are called moldavites. Some of you have made jewelry with those, possibly as another tektite. Related to impacts, yeah? Did you touch on uh, palisites earlier, or did I miss it? You know, I, I did, but it was so brief. It's it, it was almost like... I barely touched on it. So this, this would be a palisite for sure. Two types of palisites. One have got round crystals of olivine in them. And some of them have got broken crystals of olivine. This is uh, not really round, so I, it, but it's a palisite. Um, and it's the major and the, the showiest type of, of uh, stony iron. And... Um, it, 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 this is unusual because it's actually, if, if, uh, if the lower half, only the lower, if I had only the lower half, somebody would say, well, this is an iron meteorite, and it could be misclassified. But um, this is actually a combination of an iron meteorite in the bottom and a palisite on the top. So it's uh, olivine and there may be some pyroxene crystals. That's what those crystals are in here. And I didn't bring it, but... I've got another slice at home of one that's a lot smaller, but it's uh, translucent, and you can see the crystals of olivine. There's a couple famous ones for that. Um, so, and I, I didn't talk a lot about them, and I don't have a lot to say, except that they apparently resemble an area maybe close to the core of an asteroid and the mantle of an asteroid. But now, uh, recent um, my recent reading seems to indicate that they're thinking now that a lot of these were broken up and that you may have had a stony uh, meteorite or one uh, or a stony portion of an asteroid that struck an iron core of an asteroid and and caused this basically a breccia. So there's still, uh, I don't know if they, there are any definite conclusions on what caused palisites and um, they're fascinating and uh, they, the, the, the classic explanation is they are a core mantle boundary <coughs> type of thing, a liquid iron nickel core and a mantle composed of olivine and some pyroxenes. Um, 
Here's a piece of Johnstown we talked about earlier. This was brought in by one of the comets. Nice piece. It's, it's mostly all hyperstein, which is the ortho orthopyroxene that you find in some meteorites. And there's also an instatite um, meteorite that's just called, is classified as an instatite meteorite. But this is hyperstein. This is the one that fell in 1924 during the funeral and during the ball games and the 4th of July celebrations in Johnstown. Um, and then in Berthin, in, in um, 2004, um, a, uh, another unique um, meteorite called a eucrite, which represents the crust of an asteroid, and they actually know where this came from, which asteroid it came from, as well as a Johnstown. Both of these came from an asteroid called Vesta. You may have heard of that. And Vesta may be um, the only intact um, asteroid that's got a core and a mantle still. And um, so those two pieces are from Vesta, and I don't know if I've got any others. Um, but they know where they come from. Now, um, iron meteorites are classified. There's about 15 or 16 different classifications. They used to classify them by the size, uh, the width and the size of the uh, Whitman statin patterns. They still use that, but now it's a chemical classification. And um, so they go by the amounts of uh, minor elements like iridium and gallium and some of the others and platinum. And um, uh, but they, they also think now that, that many of these uh, 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 originate from, from uh, a huge event that occurred just a few, a couple hundred of million years after the origin of the solar system. As a matter of fact, I've read that they now, they call, um, they say that the, the, the gas planets like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus were, were um, closer to the sun at one time, about where the Earth is now. And they had the gas planet migration, which means they moved out to where they are now. I'm not sure, I couldn't tell you why, but you're saying that's what happened. And um, uh, there's, there's so many things we're learning from meteorites, uh, and as well as their studies of uh, uh, using telescopes and, and, um, and uh, some of the research rocket ships that are going up and satellites, that it's just amazing what, that, what they have learned. Um, Back in the mid-70s, they thought maybe meteorites came from asteroids. They weren't sure. There were two or three or four major theories on how the solar system formed. And now they've pretty much got it down. So this tells you a lot. And yeah, I'm going on, on and on. So Okay. Well, I think we should uh, thank Gary and then come up and... Gary, I, I just had one question. Oh, yes. Yeah. You had mentioned comets, Colorado Meteorites Society. Yeah, Colorado Meteorite Society. Okay, are they currently meeting and are they accepting new members? Well, yeah, we are. We, we welcome new members. We haven't been active. COVID kind of shut us down. Excuse me. And we have not got going up again. But I'm, I've been talking to Ann about uh, doing an Ask Debbie. So, um, yeah, yeah, go to the, it, the website is peak2peak.com. Okay. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, I apologize for all that that she had earlier today.